Marchetti and Marx, 1974, said, There exists in our nation today a powerful and dangerous secret cult, the cult of intelligence. Its holy men are the clandestine professionals of the Central Intelligence Agency. Its patrons and protectors are the officials of the federal government. Its membership, extending far beyond governmental circles, reaches into the power centres of industry, commerce, finance and labour. Its friends are many in the areas of important public influence, the academic world and the communications media. The cult of intelligence is a secret fraternity of the American political aristocracy. The purpose of the cult is to further the foreign policies of the US government by covert and usually illegal means, while at the same time containing the spread of its avowed enemy, communism. Traditionally, the cult's hope has been to foster a world order in which America would reign supreme, the unchallenged international leader. Today, however, that dream stands tarnished by time and frequent failures. Thus, the cult's objectives are now less grandiose, but no less disturbing. It seeks largely to advance America's self-appointed role as the dominant arbiter of social, economic and political change in the awakening regions of Asia, Africa and Latin America. And its worldwide war against communism has to some extent been reduced to a covert struggle to maintain a self-serving stability in the third world, using whatever clandestine methods are available. This cult is patronised and protected by the highest level government officials in the world. Its membership is composed of those in the power centres of government, industry, commerce, finance and labour. It manipulates individuals in areas of important public influence, including the academic world and the mass media. The secret cult is a global fraternity of a political aristocracy whose purpose is to further the political policies of persons or agencies unknown. It acts covertly and illegally. Socially, as well as professionally, they clicked together, forming a sealed fraternity. They ate together at their own special favourite restaurants. They partied almost only among themselves. Their families drifted to each other, so their defences did not always have to be up. In this way, they increasingly separated themselves from the ordinary world and developed a rather skewed view of that world. Their own dedicated double life became the proper norm, and they looked down on the life of the rest of the citizenry. And out of this grew what was later named, and condemned, as the cult of intelligence, an inbred, distorted, elitist view of intelligence that held it to be above the normal processes of society with its own rationale and justification, beyond the restraints of the Constitution, which applied to everything and everyone else. The CIA is both the centre and the primary instrument of the cult of intelligence. It engages in espionage and counter-espionage, in propaganda and disinformation, the deliberate circulation of false information, in psychological warfare and paramilitary activities. It penetrates and manipulates private institutions and creates its own organisations, called proprietaries, when necessary. It recruits agents and mercenaries. It bribes and blackmails foreign officials to carry out its most unsavoury tasks. It does whatever is required to achieve its goals, without any consideration of the ethics involved or the moral consequences of its actions. As the secret action arm of American foreign policy, the CIA's most potent weapon is its covert intervention in the internal affairs of countries the US government wishes to control or influence. Romanticised by myths, the operations of the CIA are also beclouded by false images and shielded by official deceptions. Its practices are hidden behind arcane and antiquated legalisms, which prevent the public and even Congress from knowing what the mysterious agency is doing or why. This the cult of intelligence justifies with dramatic assertions that the CIA's purpose is to preserve the national security, that its actions are in response to the needs of the nation's defence. No one in an age in which secrecy is the definitional operative of security need know more than that. The cult is intent upon conducting the foreign affairs of the US government without the awareness or participation of the people. 
it recognises no role for a questioning legislature or an investigative press. Its adherents believe that only they have the right and the obligation to decide what is necessary to satisfy the national needs. Although it pursues outmoded international policies and unattainable ends, the cult of intelligence demands that it not be held accountable for its actions by the people it professes to serve. It is a privileged as well as secret charge. In their minds, those who belong to the cult of intelligence have been ordained and their service is immune from public scrutiny. The clandestine mentality is a mindset that thrives on secrecy and deception. It encourages professional amorality, the belief that righteous goals can be achieved through the use of unprincipled and normally unacceptable means. Thus, the cult's leaders must tenaciously guard their official actions from public view. To do otherwise would restrict their ability to act independently. It would permit the American people to pass judgment on not only the utility of their policies, but the ethics of those policies as well. With the cooperation of an acquiescent, ill-informed Congress and the encouragement and assistance of a series of presidents, the cult has built a wall of laws and executive orders around the CIA and itself, a wall that has blocked effective public scrutiny. When necessary, the members of the cult of intelligence, including our presidents, who are always aware of, generally approve of, and often actually initiate the CIA's major undertakings, have lied to protect the CIA and to hide their own responsibility for its operations. The Eisenhower administration lied to the American people about the CIA's involvement in the Guatemalan coup d'etat in 1954, about the agency's support of the unsuccessful rebellion in Indonesia in 1958, and about Francis Gary Power's 1960 U-2 mission. The Kennedy administration lied to about the CIA's role in the abortive invasion of Cuba in 1961, admitting its involvement only after the operation had failed disastrously. The Johnson administration lied about the extent of most US government commitments in Vietnam and Laos, and all of the CIA's. And the Nixon administration publicly lied about the agency's attempt to fix the Chilean election in 1970. For adherence to the cult of intelligence, hypocrisy and deception, like secrecy, have become standard techniques for preventing public awareness of the CIA's clandestine operations and governmental accountability for them. And these men who ask that they be regarded as honourable men, true patriots, will, when caught in their own webs of deceit, even assert that the government has an inherent right to lie to its people.